Okay, chapter 14 is on alcohols and ethers. Which, Hello, Professor. Yeah. Can you go over uh, some of the problems on worksheet number five, if that's okay? From on worksheet number one? Number five? Yes. Um, let me see. We're talking about the um the ones with the answers. Yes, uh with the reaction ones. Yeah. The okay. Um does that involve alcohols? I believe so. Okay. We're gonna go over that today. Okay, sounds good. At the end of this lecture today. Got it. Um, if you want, I can pull it up. It'll make more sense. That's fine. Okay. All right. All right. Um, chapter 14 is on um, alcohols, phenols, and ethers. This is a really an important chapter. Alcohols are like everywhere biologically. Phenols everywhere. Ethers <coughs> excuse me. And ethers not as much but still important biological molecules. So um, we talked so far about carbon and hydrogen, um, both single and double double bonded. Um, we haven't talked about oxygen at all. And later in the chapter, we're going to talk a tiny bit about sulfur as well, because sulfur is right underneath oxygen. And as you remember, everything in a group has similar chemical characteristics. So if sulfur is under oxygen, that means sulfur acts a lot like oxygen. Now, um, I'm going to be getting into electronegativity in a second here. Okay, if you remember from Lewis dot structures, oxygen has two bonds, either a double bond or two singles. Now, alcohols, phenols, and ethers are all single bonded oxygen carbon, not in the next unit, we're going to talk about the double bonded oxygen. But in this unit, we're only talking about single bonded oxygens. Now, a hydroxyl group is an OH functional group. So wherever that OH is attached on the backbone, that will determine numbering when you go to name, name these guys. A phenol is a aromatic alcohol. And the reason it's aromatic is because of the benzene ring. This is what phenol looks like. And phenol acts a little bit differently than, than a non-aromatic alcohol. It's much more stable. And because of that, it's, it has some different characteristics. And then an ether is a COC. And the way you name ethers, that's, there's two ways to name an ether. We're going to be naming ethers the simple way. And that you would just name what's over here. Okay. Now, the thing about alcohols, particularly, is the oxygen's electronegativity value. Now, from 305, theoretically, you learned about electronegativity. Is that a fair statement? Yeah, we did. Okay. Electronegativity is the tendency for one atom to attract electrons from an adjacent atom. Okay. okay? So it's the tendency for one atom to attract electrons from an adjacent atom. So if we have an O and an H, electronegativity value for hydrogen is 2.1, electronegativity value for oxygen is 3.5.
So the polarity of a bond can be determined by the difference in electronegativities between the two atoms. If it's greater than 0.5, it's considered polar. And this, this range goes from zero to two in a continuum. So as it starts getting more and more, um, the delta is more and more, uh, as soon as you hit 0 0.5, then it's considered polar. Now this can go way up, way up. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now if you look at the difference between oxygen and hydrogen in terms of electronegativity, it's 1.4 difference. So that's way above 0.5. Even oxygen next to carbon is still one. So it's still considered polar. When you look at just carbon and hydrogen, the difference in electronegativity is just 0.4. So it's considered nonpolar. Okay. Now, this is a big deal when we start talking about intermolecular forces. Intermolecular forces are the forces between molecules, not within a molecule, between molecules. Okay, so we're going to keep going back to this concept of electronegativity when we get into um, how the bond is actually formed. We're not OH. Ethanol is drinking alcohol. Menthol is they frequently add this to improve um, uh, um, flavor. They used to have menthol cigarettes. I don't know if they still do or not. And they would always smell better than a standard cigarette. And again, it's alcohol. Cholesterol, everyone's heard of cholesterol. That's an organic alcohol. And alcohols in biological systems, again, are all over the place. When you look at glucose, I was drawing another blur. So carbohydrates are also alcohols. Alcohols in general are usually not good for you. Um, drinking alcohol isn't as poisonous as other alcohols. For example, if we were looking at that alcohol, that will poison you. It'll, it, you'll go blind if you drink this stuff. It'll still make you drunk. Sailors on submarines during World War II used to drink torpedo juice because it used to make them high. They would get a. They would become drunk drinking torpedo juice. What? Torpedo juice was meth methanol. Methanol will pass the blood brain barrier just like ethanol will and um, make you drunk or at least you know lightheaded, like you're feeling intoxicated. However, many sailors during World War II were blind because of the torpedo juice they were drinking. Rubbing alcohol. That's what rubbing alcohol looks like, isopropanol. All right, when we're naming alcohols, we're gonna be using the OL to distinguish where that functional group is located. So it's the same thing as before. We determine the backbone and then the location. After we number the backbone, the location of the functional group, the OL. 
Um, professor, on the last slide or the slide you were just on, should we have those memorized or just the names? Um, you won't have to memorize either one of those. It'll, it'll, it'll just come out um, in the naming process. Okay, just making sure, like, because you know how there's just some, like, like, I think on the benzene, like, they had the common names, and yeah. so you kind of want to know, just remember the structures. I was just making sure, like, um, we didn't need to know any of those specifically. Well, you need to know phenol. Mm -hmm. That's the only one. And in okay. Fact, it's always the benzene-related ones where you have to go with the common name. Okay, cool. But definitely don't have to worry about memorizing cholesterol. I mean, you know what it just know it exists. It's a big, giant, nonpolar molecule that is an alcohol. Uh, and we synthesize it internally as well. Um, menthol is, don't worry about that one. Just know that it's used as a flavoring uh, agent to make things smell good. But it's also an alcohol. So it would, it would uh, undergo alcohol reactions, but you don't have to know the structure. Okay, so back to naming. Um, Six-membered ring, hence it's a hexa, and the functional group is on carbon number three. Now, if we had a, say, another uh, carbon here, the functional group determines the number, not the branches. So this would be five methyl, three hexanol. Okay. Again, backbone, we have functional group. What's an alcohol on carbon number three? And we have two branches. Now we're not going to use very many multiple hydroxyl groups. Um, but if you do, you have to name them. And you, you don't call them an OL, you call them a diol if they're two, triol if they're three. We just won't get into all that. Um, there's enough stuff going on in this chapter that we don't need to add a little. Um, nuance like that. It, it just now the aromatic alcohol. I just talked about phenol. Um, you'd name it, um, and carbon number one is going to be where the functional group is. So that's going to be carbon number one, and you'd name it going left and name it going right, and choose the one with the lower numbers. Now on this last one. If you go left or right, you end up with the same numbering system. So it's a moot point. But if you had, um, like if the bromine was here, it would matter then which one to use. Going to the right, we'd have uh, two, four, five. Going to the left, we would have three, four, Six, tribal phenol. So this one would have been out. Okay, hey, did that make sense? Now, this is really important. Alcohols can be attached in three different locations along a backbone. This is on the end. And that's now called a primary alcohol. If they're in the middle and you've got one H, it's secondary. If you have it in the middle with no alcohols, or no, excuse me, no H's,
called tertiary. Now, the reason why we distinguish between primary, secondary, tertiary is the oxidatability of the alcohol is different based on whether it's primary, secondary, tertiary. In fact, in your book, if you look on page, Page 446, uh, they talk about how breathalyzers work. This is the way a breathalyzer works. Basically, if there is a primary alcohol present in your breath, now that includes isopropanol, and methanol. So if you're driving and you get stopped by a cop and he wants to do a breathalyzer and you've been drinking rubbing alcohol, you're still going to get a DUI because a breathalyzer is going to recognize that alcohol as an alcohol. What happens, there's a little reaction. Uh, the oxidizing agent changes color from this orange to a blue light. And then within the instrument, it'll recognize how strong that blue is. The, the strength of the color determines the concentration of the alcohol. Now, what's interesting about breathalyzers is I was supposed to have jury duty next week and I postponed it till December. One of the things frequently you're on the jury duty for is a DUI. Frequently, as soon as the lawyers, the defensive lawyer finds out you have a chemistry class under your belt, they'll say, do you know how a breathalyzer works? And you'll be immediately dismissed by that lawyer if you said, yes, I know how it works. I've been on lots of juries and they always dismiss me as soon as they find out what my profession is. Because they ask me, how do I know how a DUI works? Let me give you an example of one way one person beat this rap. He had a bottle of Listerine in the glove compartment of his car. The old Listerine had alcohol in it. So he took a swig of that, spit it out. When he took the breathalyzer test, he registered really high because it was registering the Listerine in his breath because it was in his, in his mouth. That's a problem. Uh, the best test is if you know, if you get stopped and you know you haven't been drinking and they claim you have, the blood test is the best way to go. Okay. Now, because alcohols have a very polar bond here, Let's see, I think there's a oops, what happened? So let's go back up to Because the oxygen has a very high electronegativity, it will attract electrons from both sides here. So that makes the oxygen more negative. <coughs> they need the hydrogen or the carbon. And what these little squiggly marks mean, that means partial. So this is partially negative carbon makes the carbon over here partially positive and the hydrogen partially positive. Because the hydrogen is really negative, it's going to track the partially positive hydrogens. And that's, and that's called hydrogen bonds and that's they are strong as far as intermolecular forces go. IMFs.
Now that's why water is particularly strong because water has got two OHs. So the arrow always points to the more negative of the two. So because water has two OHs, it's really, really polar. Alcohols have one OH, so they're polar, but not like alcohol, uh, not like water. So in our class, Sometimes you're asked about whether something will boil higher than something else. That's when you look for the intermolecular force groups. If there's an oxygen in there and a hydrogen's attached to it, that's an alcohol. Immediately it has high IMF. That means the boiling point is higher. You can think of intermolecular forces as stickiness. The higher the IMF, the stickier the molecule is to itself or another molecule that has high IMF, like water. High IMF molecules, take it takes more energy to get them out into the gas phase from the liquid phase because they're stickier, so they have higher IMFs. So you can take a liquid like pentane with no oxygen in it, and it boils at a much lower boiling point than water or ethanol. Okay. There are two terms that you might have had in your three or five class or biology classes. It's called hydrophobic and hydrophilic. Hydrophobic refers to something that's less soluble or insoluble in water. Hydro, it refers to water, phobic is fear. There's also hydrophilic. And that's the opposite of hydrophobic. Hydrophilic means water loving. So let's take a look at this molecule now. This molecule is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So this is ethanol. And it's one ethanol, also a primary, and it's on the end. So primary alcohol. Okay, so there are two parts to this molecule. When you have a very polar part of the molecule, that's going to be the that part of the molecule. The carbons attached to other carbons to hydrogens, that would be the hydrophilic part. Now, when you have a molecule that has a hydrophilic and a hydrophobic part, they can function as something called an emulsifier. Now, when we get into um, carboxylic acids and lipids, we're going to talk a lot about emulsifiers, but those are the requirements for emulsifier. Hydrophilic part, hydrophobic part. One other thing, depending on how long this chain is or how short it is, will determine how much the hydrogen bonding takes over. So if you have a very short hydrophilic part, then a, 
and an OH on that same molecule, it's going to be very high bonding to water. If the chain is really, really long, like for example, a fatty acid, you have like 18 carbons, then that long chain has much more effect than one with a short chain. Now, this is where this graph comes in. When the chain is seven carbons long, then that hydrophilic end takes over. So the alcohol starts acting like an alkane of seven carbons or more. Up to that point, it acts more like a hydrogen bonding. So these guys have massive hydrogen bonding. The alcohols down here, like octanol, decanol, they act just like an alkane because those long linear hydrophilic tails take over. That makes sense? Carbon seven is the key number there. So when um, when they equal each other at seven carbons, is it almost like it just doesn't matter that one side is hydrophilic, one side is hydro hydrophobic? Like overall, it's nonpolar at that point? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Okay. Because the, okay, got it. The um, um, little bits of um, polarity in the alkane add up. But if you don't have enough of them, they don't add up enough to overcome the um, hydrogen bonding of the alcohol. But once you hit seven, the little ones add up to enough to, to counteract the, the polarity of the OH group. So um, when it's less than seven, like the one butanol with its hydrophobic end, what does that what does that kind of mean? Like it has greater H bonds or? It, yeah, the hydrogen bonding is greater. Okay, it's more strong, so it's like harder to break apart. Yeah, it's just stickier. They want to stick to one another. Hence the boiling point is higher. Solubility. Oh, okay. Boiling point. Boiling point. Okay, got it's it. Not, it's not just boiling point, though. It, it's melting point, boiling point, uh, how soluble they are in water. Is it density, too, or no? Yes. Density will change, too. It's, that's not as predictable. Okay. Because notice it says linear here. See, if the alkanes were branched, you have to have a much bigger molecule. Like if this said branched alkanes, you probably have to go to like carbon 12 or anything happened, but this is linear. Okay. Um, um, we haven't talked about ethers yet much. Um, ethers do not have as much excuse me, polarity as OH groups do. Hence, they act more like alkanes. However, they're not alkanes. So what I want you to do is view this like this. So the ethers are in between Okay, so down here we have alkanes and alkenes. They have almost no intermolecular forces. They have something called London dispersion forces, which are the little tiny ones. 
ethers, because of the oxygen in there, has more ion uh, intermolecular forces. This could also be a graph of intermolecular forces as well. Because boiling point intermolecular forces are directly proportional to one another. So we have alkenes and alkanes on the bottom. Next up are ethers, then above that are alcohols. Now, we're going to be talking about these kind of graphs in every time we have a new functional group. What are the intermolecular forces here at work? All right. Now we're going to start on reactions. Um, if we go to, um, if we go to our handy dandy chart. Okay. Hello, Professor. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, for dry lab two today, is that supposed to be for Monday or do we come to lab today as well? No, Monday, um, Monday's lab is uh, for next Monday, which is dry lab two. Okay, so uh, we don't have to come to lab today for Wednesday? No, you're going to come to lab today for dry lab number two. It's just that the Monday folks don't have a Monday lab until next week, and they'll do dry lab number two. And then Wednesday of next week is going to be a review session, a review session on reactions. And anyone anyone can come to that, including okay. the Monday folks. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. So we have this flow chart here. Um, and we can do a lot of things to alcohols, okay? We can make an alkene from an alcohol. We can make an ether from an alcohol. We can treat an alcohol under oxidation, and it depends if the alcohol was primary, secondary, or tertiary, what you end up with. And this is why you need to know whether the alcohol is primary, secondary, or tertiary. As notice here, no reaction if it's a tertiary alcohol. So tertiary alcohols cannot be oxidized. Secondary ones can be, primary ones can be. Okay, okay now this is that part of that chart I keep referring back, <clears throat> excuse me, I keep referring back to. That, let me just bring that up. You can uh, try to just show you is this one here, but really you need to have full context of where we are in here. Okay, um, alcohols can burn. I mean, they can undergo combustion. I think we have a spark present. Okay, alcohols can create an alkene by reacting with sulfuric acid. And notice there's a temperature issue. So if we have an alcohol in the presence of a strong acid like sulfuric acid, they can pull off the OH along with a hydrogen. And you're gonna end up with an alkene or an ether, depending on the temperature in which it's done. So this reaction requires a temperature. And I'll show you how this works in, in a few minutes. Also, I'm gonna stress again, you need to be able to identify the alcohol as primary, secondary, tertiary, because 
the tertiary one, um, I'm going to show you why as well. Tertiary one cannot react, can't oxidize. You can also create an alcohol by starting with an aldehyde ketone and then reducing it. Reduce, reduction is the opposite of oxidation. All right, so this chart you need to print off <laughs> and have at your side. It's very handy. Okay, um, let's go back to... Okay, so when we look at the chat, answer any questions on there. It is a required lab today, it's not optional. Okay, so Wednesday lab people need to come to Wednesday lab. Yeah, let's see. All right, so once the people come to lab today, Monday people go to Monday lab next week, they'll be doing dry lab two. Wednesday people need to do dry lab two today. Wednesday of next week is gonna be optional. That'll be, I'm just gonna be, it's gonna be a, a work day where I'm gonna be talking about uh, reactions. I'll have worksheets similar to the ones that I uh, put on uh, under files. And must be working through reactions and how to, that's the hardest part of this class. Everyone says reactions are hard. And that's what I want to spend more time on per chapter on the reaction part. Professor? Yeah. Um, the file you just pulled up about the alcohol thing that you just showed us, is it under lab related on Canvas? No. It's or no, it was under, um, here, let me just do it. So if you go to um, files unit one. Mm -hmm. And you'll see it there. Okay. Thank you. Wait, I don't know. I forgot if I put it in the module. Hold on. I'm going to add it to. There, it's in modules now. Yeah, the dry labs, if you go to um, Canvas, the dry labs are in, uh, in files under uh, lab related. Okay, so let's get back to this chapter here. Um, okay. Okay, so if we subject an alcohol to, sometimes you'll see it, instead of H2S before they'll put an H plus there, but it isn't just any H plus, it's gotta be a super strong acid. And that's why they usually have 
H2SO4 there. So our class, we need to put H2SO4. Um, 180 degrees, blend up, and this is usually with a mix. What happens is the water is pulled off. When the water is pulled off, it's the opposite reaction to what we had when we added water to a double bond. Then we created an alcohol. If we pull off water from an alcohol, we, we go back to the double bonded carbon. <laughs> okay. Um, as an example, let's start with two propanol, three carbon, alcohol, and carbon number two. We have one, two, three. Now, for this to happen, we have to form water. So, OH is part of the water, and we need an H to go along with it. And it has to be on another carbon, not on itself. Okay, so here's a hydrogen here, and there's also a hydrogen there. So that's water, and that's water. Okay, so what did I just create? So there's hydrogen here and a hydrogen there. So do you see a two ways I can get water off that three carbon alcohol? I can go to the left or I can go to the right. Either one, that's the H2O. So over here, we have the water. Over here, we have the water. The one on the left, we get the water from the two left carbons. The two right carbons, we get the water from the right side. Now, these two molecules are the same molecule. And that's because we started with a three carbon backbone. If we had a four carbon backbone, we would get definitely different. I'm going to show you those in a minute. All right, so is this, is this starting to make sense? So we need two carbons, one with an OH group on it and another one with an H. If that's adjacent to the carbon with the OH, we can pull it together under these conditions here. Yes. <laughs> All right, let me do some more examples. So both of these... Uh, each of these are called lumpropene, depending on which direction you start the number. So in this case, there's no mix. Wait, um, we don't have to indicate where the double bond is, or we do? 
Right there. One propene. Right. And um, so propene has three carbons, right? Correct. So for the first one, is that one propene? And for the second one, can is that two propene? No. Remember that when you have an alkene, the first carbon you encounter. Oh, oh, the... right, because you can you can number the other way. Yeah. Exactly. Okay, got it. Exactly. Got it. Okay. That's why so, there's no mix. Okay, and this you're just showing this though because um, when we are given say like a longer molecule that can mix, um, we need to know the different places that the double bond can go. Exactly. Okay, so like on a test how would that look? We would just get like a longer molecule and we'd be asked to say, or like list the products it can form? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Let's do one. <laughs> okay, so um, let's take, um, um, let's do uh, one more carbon than propane, just do but um, butanol. Um, let's do it right there. So this is two, which all? And this would be what it looks like on the test. In other words, what happens? Well, do we have the conditions Yeah, you need one, you need an OH, okay? Number two, we need an adjacent hydrogen on another carbon. Okay, so we have that, so we have Here's the OH right here, OH. Then we have an H here, and we have an H here on adjacent carbons. So that's two combinations of water. Each one creates a different molecule. Let me... Uh, do it by colors at the moment. So here's an H here, and here's an H there. Let's do so yes. for um, any like general alcohol like that, um, is it kind of like wherever the OH group is attached, the double bond can be on either side? Exactly. Products. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. And so, what if we had, um, say, like that, but where you have that blue H? What if there was another um, group attached? You gotta have um, like that. Yeah. Yeah. There's Would you still have an H there? Yes. So Remember, right now, right now you have H two. Right. Carbon has, carbon has four bonds. So mm -hmm. we have this carbon here. One, two, three bonds, four bonds. Okay, so it, it'd still be the same thing. The double bond could go on either side. Yeah, either side of the okay. yeah. And in, and this is a secondary alcohol also. Because it's in the middle. Um. Oh, okay. So I meant to ask about the different types of alcohol. So primary, it's on the end. Secondary, it's on the middle, you say? And then ter what's tertiary? Tertiary is in the middle also. But a secondary is got an alcohol or a hydrogen here. Tertiary doesn't. 
Okay, in secondary, the carbon is bonded to one H. In tertiary, the carbon is bonded to Zero. the rest of the, yeah, the rest of the three bonds are on our groups. Yeah, are, are not hydrogen. Okay, got it. Okay, so um, basically, we're going to surround the OH with double bonds. Okay, we can either go to the left on the blue side and go to the right on the red side. So the same backbone. So we have four carbon backbone. Okay, and if we do the getting the um, blue hydrogen, we end up with this. Because we're gra grabbing the left handed hydrogen off of the OH. If we grab the right handed one, we'll be like that. So this is one chain, and this is two. Now, a mix, remember, right? So whenever there's a mix, we have to we have to say which one is more stable. Which one is, which one are we gonna get more of in the mix? Well, we go by two rules. We go with symmetry and Markovnikov. Symmetry, Markovnikov, okay? On the middle one, is that more symmetrical compared to the right one? The left is more symmetrical. I'm sorry? Is that a yes? Yes. Okay. Markovnikov's rule, look at the terminal carbons. We have three and three versus three and two. We have three hydrogens. So six versus five. So Makovnikov is so in both counts, a symmetry argument and a Markovnikov argument is yes and yes. So the one in the middle, not the one in the middle, one on the left is going to be more stable. Hence the percent yield is going to be higher. So you're going to circle this. Okay, so that would be a typical reaction problem. And that's what this is. Um, could you do an example with like a tertiary alcohol and a dehydration reaction? Okay, so this is um, two butanol. And it's got a methyl group on two also. So it's two methyl, two butanol. Okay, so this is a tertiary alcohol because there's no hydrogen there. 
consist carbon-carbon double bond, a carbon-carbon single bonds. All right. Now, first thing we need to locate adjacent carbon and whether there's a hydrogen there or not. There's one there and there's one um, there. So we're going to get a mix. We're going to go to double bond to the left of the OH group, double bond to the right. <coughs> The backbone's the same. And we use the black hydrogen and get this. We do the red hydrogen, we're going to get. Oops. Double bond there. So we go either side of the OH. Now, if the OH is on the end, we're only going to get one double bond because you only have one adjacent hydrogen. Like this guy here. Um, I guess I'm just trying to ask, is there ever a case where the oxygen or the OH group is towards the middle of the molecule, but it wouldn't go to two possible spots. It would only go to one. Yes. Oh, wait a minute. Um, you said if the OH is in the middle? Yeah, is there ever a case where it doesn't have both options open? Yeah, you can tie, up, tie it up like this. Now, there are two H's here, right? But if yes, we, sir. But if we had that, there are no H's there. Really? Okay, right. That's what I was trying to, I think that's what I was thinking of, but I didn't know how to put it. So it could only go to the right. Correct. Okay. Exactly. Yeah, so in that case, the um, that wouldn't exist. And then that was the same concept with an OH on the end. It could only go to one. Exactly. Side. Okay, so would you say those are the only two situations where the um, bond is kind of like tied up, like forced to go to one place? That's all we're going to run into in this class. Okay, for sure, for sure. Um, in fact, when you're synthesizing something and you only want to end up with a molecule that has a non-mixture, you'd have to think about exactly what we're talking about here, is how can I tie up that hydrogen on the left? I can tie it up with another group that's not hydrogen, because it requires hydrogen. So if something's there other than hydrogen, it can't go that way. And it gets very tricky trying to find the precursor to something you want to make. Because in, in this case, if, if we didn't have those methyl groups on that carbon, we'd end up with a mixture. And then mixtures, then you got to purify the mixture. So in this case, we'd end up with um, one butene, and we have a methyl group at carbon two and three. We have two, three, three, five, methyl, one, 
you too. And of course, this one here, we didn't account for the other methods over here correctly. So let's rewrite this guy. Um, Yep, change that. Two, three, three, trimethyl two, butanol. Okay, so um, let's do the same reaction in a different temperature, like at 140. Can you please go back to the last problem? Is it your cherry alcohol really quickly? I just want to glance at it again real quick. Which one over to the right? Uh, the one that we just did, the very last one. Is it your cherry alcohol? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And remember, everyone, I have copies of the slides in a PDF format for you as well under, uh, under files. You go to um, unit one and it says slides, and there's a worksheet folder and a slide uh, folder, and that's where all the PDFs are that I'm using. Okay, thank you so much. Now, we're in chapter 14 in your book. The book does a really good job on reactions. Um, I think my graphics are better than theirs. <laughs> they do cover a lot of really interesting things. So. I, I recommend you go to the chapter as well. And what I'd like to do is assign some problems. A lot of nice reaction problems. And these are the problems I'm gonna be going over on um, Wednesday next week, are the textbook problems. And that'll be the review process. Okay, so let's let's go on. All right, so dehydration means pulling off a water, dehydrate. You want to dehydrate an alcohol again, and you end up under proper conditions. I repeat, under proper conditions, you end up with an alkene with the same backbone and a possible mix. Unless the double bond is on the end or one of the adjacent carbon Hydrogen is tied up like we just, exactly we just did. But chemically, um, this is done all the time. Um, I'm going to talk about this when we get into um, carbohydrate, um, uh, carbohydrate metabolism. And this is part of the Krebs cycle here. Like this is why it's called the citric acid cycle. Because that is citric acid. Okay. Um, now, this is called a mechanism. We're covering no mechanisms in here. And this is how it works at the electron level. What happens is one of the H's from the acid goes over to the OH group on the end and forms a carbocation, which is very unstable, hence it forces the water off. But we're going to we're not going to be doing any mechanisms in this class. All right, so let's dehydrate under a lower temperature. What happens when we end up with an ether? So at 180, we get a we get an alkene. At 140, we get an ether. Now, in our class, we're always going to be creating a balanced ether. 
In other words, the alcohol is going to be the same alcohol on either side. So in this case, we're starting off with ethanol. So ethanol. Now, whenever, whenever we form ethers, think in your mind, the backbone is going to be doubled. Okay? So... So that means we need two alcohols to start with. Okay, and then we're still gonna pull off water because we're dehydrating that alcohol. We're still gonna find water. We get water from one of the OHs and one of the H's from the other alcohol. And where they stick together that's where the oxygen is between the two sides. The way we're going to name these is going to be a dye for our class. Now, if you're in another class, a higher level organic class, then you have to name these differently. And your book names these the official way. And we're going to use the, a simpler version of that. Only applies to ethers, so. though. Okay, so let's use this as an example. Okay, so we have ethanol. Ethanol. So this is going to stick to that. The backbone is going to be double. So we have, that's not ethanol, that's propanol. Okay, so we're going to have a double backbone. So propanol is three carbons, propanol is three carbons, three plus three is six. So we're going to have a six plus one backbone. We have three carbons, three carbons. Our new backbone is going to have six carbons plus the oxygen tying them together. And to tie them together, let's see, let's put it in a different place. To get an ether, do the two alcohols have to be the same? No, they don't. If you have different alcohols, you get a complicated mixture. That's because if you had two alcohols, for example, say you have propanol and ethanol, okay, when these join randomly, you're going to have some with two ethanols, some with two propanols, some with one of each. So you end up with a complex mixture. Then you have to determine which is, which is uh, more stable, blah, blah, blah. We're going to just stick to the same alcohol. Okay. <laughs> Will um, those types of problems, though, with two different alcohols be on our test or just same? Same. Okay. It adds complexity, and there's no need for the complexity. You know, and, <laughs> and I agree. Okay. Um, now, to name this guy, well, we have two propyls. So it's dipropyl ether. And your book, you see. Well, it names it both ways. It names it the official way, 
and it names it the way I'm showing you. So dipropyl ether, if we had different ones on either side, we'd have to say um, ethyl propyl ether. Um, but this is, we're just gonna keep this simple, okay? So there's a big difference between the two temperatures, big difference. Now, I want you to think about this problem. Which do you think, let me look at the chats here real quick. <laughs> okay. Um, which do you think requires more energy to do? The uh, dehydration of an alcohol at 180 degrees or the formation of ether at 140 degrees. Which do you think um, is, a, is a reaction that uh, has to be forced more than the other one? This is kind of a tricky question to just FYI. Remember the other reaction? Let me summarize these two reactions. Maybe the um, alkene has to be more forced because the temperature is higher. Yes, that's exactly right. So, okay, that said, could you form ethers while trying to do an alkene reaction or after a certain temperature do ethers not form anymore yeah if you were going like the 160 you'd probably get a mix an ugly mix of a bunch of stuff um okay so yeah the formation of an ether does that 140 formation of an al alkene you gotta spell it right uh, at 180. So the higher temperature means that it doesn't want to do it as much. Now, if you remember, last week we talked about alkene reactions. Alkenes are not very stable. They want to react. So when you're trying to create something that's not particularly stable, you have to put a lot of energy into the system. Get there. Then you have to be careful once you're there because <laughs> it's going to want to react again. You have to make sure it's kind of in a, in a good place, doesn't have anything around so it can react. So yeah, the alkene reaction requires more energy because the alkene isn't as stable as the ether. Because nature wants to go from unstable to stable. If you're going from stable to unstable, it requires energy. Does that make sense? Okay, so. so we talked about dehydration under two different temperature. Next, we're gonna talk about oxidation. Now in organic chemistry, we talk about the removal of hydrogens. In, 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 in inorganic chemistry, like 305, we talked about losing electrons. Okay, so loss of electron means that, that uh, atom is being oxidized because the oxidation number increases. When they gain an electron, the oxidation number goes down or it's reduced, hence the name reduction. In organic chemistry, we lose a hydrogen oxidation, we gain a hydrogen, it's reduced. Now, this is where the primary, secondary, tertiary comes into play. So, <laughs> now in the, our class, we're not going to worry about the particular oxidation, oxidizing reagent. This is dichromate on the left, or manganate on the right. Those are two very common 
oxidizing agents. And actually they change color too when they're reduced. So an oxidizing agent oxidizes something. That means it's being reduced at the same time. So you always have to have oxidation and reduction going on at the same time. Because one gives an electron, the other receives it. So it's a give and take. You can't have just a give or just a take. You have to have those together. Now, To oxidize, we have to remove a hydrogen. Now, hydrogen has to be in the carbon that the OH is on. If there's no hydrogen there, it cannot be oxidized. Because on a tertiary alcohol, there's no hydrogen there. It's in the carbon. Primary alcohols have two hydrogens, so it can be oxidized twice. Secondary alcohols have one hydrogen, so it can be oxidized once. Tertiaries have none, so it can't react at all. Now, alcohol, I mean, aldehydes and, and acids are in, uh, in a future chapter, so you don't have to name the aldehyde you form or the acid you form. To say aldehyde or carbon salt acid. Same with the ketone. All right, so let's look at the examples here. If you have a primary alcohol, it means the, the uh, OH group is on the end of the backbone. So that means you have two hydrogens be removed. So it can oxidize twice. First time you end up with the this here gaining a bond and forming a carbonyl group, which is a double bonded O, and it's on the end. In carbon. Carbon that the OH was attached to. And then because there's an H still present, you can oxidize it again. Then what you end up with is this group here, which is a combination alcohol and carbonyl, carboxylic acid. Now this reaction is kind of tricky. Now if you go this way and reduce aldehyde, you end up with alcohol. So if you have a reducing agent, you can take a carboxylic acid to an aldehyde to a corresponding same backbone alcohol. And my chart that I keep pulling up has little R's and O's on there. Because this has one H, secondary alcohols only have one H, that means it can be oxidized once. And it goes to the ketone. Now, the ketone, the carbonyl group is in the middle. Just like the OH group is in the middle of the alcohol. So the OH group becomes a double bonded O. The OH group becomes both a double bonded O and an OH. And then tertiary alcohols have no hydrogens to come off. Because to oxidize it, you have to have a hydrogen. No hydrogens, no oxidation. OK. Um, I want to talk about this example. So well, that starts with ethanol.
when you drink alcohol, your body has an enzyme called D by drops yeah. Basically, we're going to take the hydrogen off and it becomes acetone. Now, because that's a primary alcohol, this can undergo further oxidation. So there's still a hydrogen there on the end. And we end up with acetic acid. And this is called the no, this is called alcohol dehydrogenase. This is called um. Aldehyde dehydrogenase. So basically, this all happens in your liver. Now, because it's a primary alcohol, it can be oxidized twice. Two carbon alcohol goes to a two carbon aldehyde, a two carbon acid. Um, so the question is, you can metabolize ethanol in your liver as long as you have enough alcohol dehydrogenase. If you don't have enough alcohol dehydrogenase, then you can't metabolize the ethanol until it, the enzyme is freed up. Culturally, it is varies. For example, Native American populations uh, uh, have had alcohol in their um, culture not as long as Europeans. Europeans have had alcohol in their culture for millennia. So they have weeded out the people that don't have high levels of alcohol dehydrogenase where, where cultures that haven't had alcohol introduced into their culture as long have not weeded out people that have low amounts of alcohol dehydrogenase and correspondingly aldehyde dehydrogenase. So it's very interesting what's going on in your liver. But anyway, that's how your body gets rid of it. And then this, this is excreted. In Europe. Okay, so. As a primary alcohol has two hydrogens. To oxidize the first time, you need a hydrogen. Oxidize the second time, you need yet another hydrogen. And that's why primary alcohols are oxidized twice. Two hydrogens, two oxidations. That's what this is showing here. Okay, um, if we take a strong oxidizing agent like potassium dichromate, A2Cr2O7, and it, if it undergoes an oxidation problem, like we have ethanol, for example, 
it's going to turn color because it's being reduced, the oxidizing agent. So we can tell then if it undergone the reaction. Because when it turns green is when it's been reduced. It goes yellow to green. So basically we dump this into that. And this is the way to test for a primary alcohol or a secondary alcohol. So if we dump this in here and it had a tertiary alcohol, what would happen? What would the color be on the right slide there? What color would that be? Would it be clear still? It'll be yellow. Or yeah, yellow. No color change for the, exactly. just no color change. Because a ter tertiary alcohol is not capable of being oxidized. If we had a secondary or primary alcohol in there, then it's gonna go to green. Because those are capable of being oxidized. For the exam, would we have to know uh, which alcohols are primary, secondary, or tertiary, or would you provide this information to us? You definitely have to know whether it's primary, secondary, or tertiary, because that'll change the reaction. So we have an alcohol, which could be either primary, secondary, or tertiary, and then it forms different products depending on what it is. If it's primary, it goes all the way to the acid. Let's see, let me move this over here. I'll go to the acid. If it's secondary, what's the ketone? Tertiary, nothing happens. And again, these can go this way as well. Those are with reduction. And to be able to identify what kind of alcohol oxidation reaction it is, we just look at the number of hydrogens attached to the carbon molecule. Yeah. So we can tell. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So if it's two carbons, it's primary one. Excuse me. If it's two hydrogens, it's uh, primary secondary. hydrogen, yeah. secondary. Yeah. No hydrogen for sure. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so um, you don't need to know how these alcohols are made. In other words, methanol, how is it made, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, Now here is an example of multiple uh, um, hydroxy groups, um, ethylene glycol, propylene glycol. These are um, in, uh, uh, present in uh, antifreeze. And uh, we're gonna find, um, when we get into the chapter on lipids, um, Lipids are long fatty acids bound to a three carbon backbone. And that three carbon backbone um, comes off when you make soap. And we're gonna go into that in fairly good detail. So there are a lot of multiple atoms, excuse me, there are lots, in fact, that's what this all looks like right here. There are a lot of biochemical molecules that have OH groups all over the place. Just you know, we talked a little about that already with the, with the cholesterol, but um, there are um, alcohols, just, you know, all the carbohydrates are really polyols. They have lots and lots of OH groups on them. 
Um, in fact, the, the chemistry of carbohydrates is the chemistry of aldehydes and ketones and alcohols, those three together. Okay, um, we haven't talked much about aromatic alcohols. And um, I think this is a good spot to stop. Um, Well, you know what? I'm going to cover these today because we still have a fair amount of time. Okay, um, an aromatic alcohol can actually lose a hydrogen atom. Alcohols cannot. So we have We have aromatic alcohols and aliphatic al uh, alcohols. That means no benzene. Aromatic alcohols have benzene. And the OH group has to be attached to the benzene. So this is one you definitely have to know in all, and it can actually lose the hydrogen off of this. That's because this charge can be shared over the ring. So if we have that is a very state unstable ion. Compared to Yes, so this is unstable. And this is stable. Well, remember, a reaction will happen if, with, with, unless you put a ton of energy in it. It will happen if, if you're going from stable to unstable. Up here, that product that anion product is fairly stable because the charge on that oxygen is shared throughout the ring here. And if we had a fused ring, it would be the same thing. In fact, this would even be more stable. This be even more stable because it's it's shared over two rings. Then, so the reason why this is stable is because that charge is being shared over the ring. Here, it's more stable because there are two rings to share it over. If we had more fused rings, it would be, it would be more stable yet. Now. If you add a base to something that's acidic, like phenol is, what happens is the base pulls off the hydrogen to form water. So on a test, if I said,
No, I make that. Well, we start with a base that's got sodium in it. That would be sodium hydroxide. And we would start with phenol. And that OH and that H is going to form water. And leave you with. This is called a conjugate base. I don't know. Did you did you use the term conjugate base in 305? Yeah, but that was so long ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, this is a conjugate base in the, the uh, anion. Don't worry about it. you don't have to know that for this class though. <laughs> yeah. Um what was how could we tell if a compound was an acid or a base? Um, okay, the definition of an acid I give everyone is the tendency to disassociate a hydrogen ion. So in other words, does that come off? Yes. When my H is all the way around here. None of those hydrogens come off. No. Only the one up here, because this guy can share that charge over the ring again. So don't worry about, this is the only example you need to worry about right here. Now we're going to get into a whole section on organic acids and bases. Okay. Um. For acids, will the molecule that the H is attached to, will it always have a negative charge when it's on its own? Yes. And then the bases, the like the K and the Na, um, they always have a positive charge on their own? Yes. So is like calcium OH a base? Yes. And there are two, two OHs on the calcium. Because calcium's got a plus two charge. Right, right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That um, would work the same way. You'd have uh, calcium hydroxide there, and you'd end up with, um, with you balanced it. You'd have two, two of the anions, and this would be. Um, This. But you have two of these. Because you have two hydroxides and calcium hydroxide. Okay, so I'm going to end it here. Um, there's a lot of um, aromatic. Um, molecules and biologicals. Um, and they're used a lot in the, nutritionally. These are very common uh, antioxidants. Um, BHA and BHT. Um, um, as far as ethers go, you know, you can have cyclic ethers. So we're going to talk about these two, when we get into carbohydrates, is this forms a uranose, like fructose, and this forms a uranose, like glucose. Okay. Um, Actually, there's, um, I think I'm going to end here. I'm going to start with ethers tomorrow in terms of the reactions. We already talked about one ether reaction. Um, there's not a lot of them. And also, um, 
I'm going to talk about um, how sulfur acts like oxygen in reactions as well. Okay. Okay, so uh, in a little while, I'll see uh, Wednesday lab folks. Um, now, the way I've set this lab up today is the worksheets are going to be in two parts, chapter 13, chapter 14. And instead of doing all of them, I want you to do either the even or the odd. I don't care which one. So you'll end up having a worksheet similar the number of problems is last week's lab one, dry lab one. Okay, so lab two is going to be a dry lab on chapter 13 and 14. So if you want to work on chapter 13s today, I've covered everything you need to know in terms of doing the problems. Actually, you can do them today. No, so, anyway. All right, I will see you in lab in a little while. And Monday, folks, I will see you Monday. <laughs> um, I have a question. Yeah. So I don't know if you remember or not, but. Uh, my friend and I said that we lived far the, far away, so we were going to stay home today from lab and just print it out and do it at home. Yes. Um. So just want to make sure, is there like two separate la or um, like packets we need to print out or? Yeah, I only... yeah, let me show you where they are. Okay, because I printed it out, I think it must be chapter 13. So there's another part we need to go to and print out too. Yeah. Okay. Let me show you. I also renamed those files. Okay. Um, am I in the, oh, never mind. Go to file. Oh, excuse me. Go to land delivery. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you have two. Dry lab twos. One yes. Keen. This is the one you've already copied. So yes. download this one and then just do the even or odd problems. Okay. Perfect. And then is there anything else we should know? Or that's that's it. Um yeah, that's that's it. Perfect. Thank you so much. Okay. Anything else, you guys? Professor Imelda Martinez here. Um, so just quick, I was talking to admissions and records to uh, make sure they have me on the canvas, but it, the canvas is still not working for me, and they told me to contact you. I emailed you the email chain with them as well. Uh, okay, so um, let me... Um, Everyone else, uh, I'll see you guys um, in lab. Uh, email to stay on. Let me get this fixed. Um, I had a question about one of the worksheets too. If you get a chance, just one of the problems. One of the which ones? I think it was week week two. I think week two, week two or week three, number eight. We oh worksheet two, number eight, problem number eight. Okay. Um, Imelda, I'll, I'll pull up in a minute. Let me just get her in the class there. Um, what's your? No, you're fine. What is your student ID? Two zero 
have to move around some windows here. Did I mark it down correctly? Yeah. Oh, do we have to put a W in the front? No. Oh. Oh, no, there we go. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Awesome. Okay, I'll have everything ready. Thank you. Cool. Okay, uh, let's see. Um, uh, okay, you said uh, week two? Yeah. Week two at numbers eight and nine. So number eight, I was wondering, because on the answers, the double bond is at the first carbon. So I was wondering if the number of the double bond isn't indicated, like between the methyl and the cyclo, can we just assume it's at the first carbon? Yes. Yeah. Whenever you're on a cyclic compound, um, the functional group will always be in carbon one. Mm, okay. Okay. And so they'll only indicate it if there's like more than one functional group, like in number nine. Yes. Yeah. The one. The one's kind of uh, superfluous here, the one, three, cyclo, dying. I guess it's better to put it down for clarity, but theoretically you don't need the one because by definition, the, the double bond will automatically be a carbon one. Got it. Okay. And then for number nine, um, I was wondering on the answer, it looks like the ethyl is at the six carbon and not the five. Oh, okay. Let me pull up the... Um, I think it's a, if you just hit the if you just hit the arrow. Oh, okay. <laughs> so it was week two, right? Mm hmm Okay. We have one. Make this bigger. Yeah, one. Two, three, four, five. So five and six. Oh, I see what you mean. This should be, yeah, it should be six, right? All right, right, right. Okay, then. Well, then those are the only two I was confused on, but I think we're good. And I'm going to change that. Um, Anyway, I'm going to change it right now. So, so you were correct. Good going. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Professor. Okay. Are you in Wednesdays? Are you in today's lab? I'm Monday. Monday. Okay. I guess I'll. But you said we could get started on um the yeah. lab if we wanted to. Yeah. Okay. You, cool. You, you could come to lab today. I mean, and not go Monday if you want. I mean, it's you got lots of room. So. Okay. <laughs> Well, Thank we, you, we, Professor. We have wet labs. I'm less flexible. In dry labs, you know, you can fill up the room twice. Okay, anyway, let me um, change this real quick. I'll need to. Okay, everyone. Um, I need to correct that worksheet, and then I'm going to sign off here. Any other quick questions? Um, I have a question. Yeah. I just want to clarify about um dry lab two. So it has two parts, right? Thirteen and fourteen right. chapters. Um, that's supposed to be done as classwork and not homework for like Monday students, right? No, you can if you want, but um, we'll just come in Monday in, in dry lab. 
Uh huh. Just have it ready, prepared for with us, like all the answers and stuff. So it's homework. It can either be homework, you come in and turn it in, or you can do it when I'm there. And it's due that day on Monday, next week, right? Yes, it's not due Monday, though. Oh, It'll okay, so. A week from Monday, I always give you a week. So we, we print the we print the, the two lab, uh, the two dry labs, and we can start on it prior to class, to yeah. what lab Monday, okay. And another thing, um, next week, next Monday is wet lab, right? Or dry? No. Um, no. Next Monday is dry lab. Okay, so the following, the after Monday would be wet lab. Yes. And then you said for us to always have like a pre-write in our notebooks, right? For that wet lab, a right. pre-write? Right. Um, so... For example, the purpose, you want us to write what the purpose is, not just write purpose and then title. And you want us to like write it out at home and then bring it to class, correct? Correct. Like explain it, not just write the headlines, like what the procedure is of the first A, like what, 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 each, what each thing is, is to write it out, correct? Yeah, because I want you to be uh, really organized in the lab. And uh, okay. if, if you don't write it out, you know, you tend not to read it. Uh, used, a while back, they used to do electronic versions and everyone just cut and paste, but they wouldn't read it. Mm -hmm. so it didn't serve any purpose. But handwriting it out, albeit it's awful, <laughs> to handwrite it out, you really read it then. Mm -hmm. And the data the data type, table as well, we write it out too, at home. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so everything. So, nope, and if there are any pre-lab questions, uh, do those. Sometimes they're pre-lab questions, sometimes there aren't. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Um, Professor, are... this is this is Shreya Tandil. I am uh like I have my dry lab today, but I have really bad cold and fever, so I won't be able to attend it. You can either do it at home or just come Monday. Okay. It'd be, it'd be better if you could come because I'll be there to answer questions. Yeah, but I don't think so I'll be able to make it. No, no, no. Come Monday, though. Okay, okay. Thank and you. Get better. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat>